Contentment is a rare commodity. Everyone wants it, but few ever find it with themselves or with what they have. It almost seems to be part of human nature to want more than we acquire what we thought was the very thing we had dreamed of having. Even on a personal basis, it seems so difficult to be content with who we are. We tend to want to be what someone else is instead of what we are. The common thought is, if I could only be like John or Jane, I'd be so very much happier. This morning, our lesson is on contentment. However, in order to have contentment, there are two attitudes regarding self that one needs to examine. The first we're going to explore is self-emptying, and second one is to, that we're going to look at is self-control. When a person begins thinking of the attitude that a Christian should have, one of the prime statements of Scripture on the subject must be Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, which states, Have this attitude in yourself, or let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Our Lord is the measuring rod for every aspect of the Christian life. Even the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 could be used as a description of Jesus and his life among us. What then is the attitude or mind of Christ that we should possess? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 11, Paul gave the core of the attitude of Jesus that we should have, and that is self-emptying. This is what Paul wrote who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the death, or to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven, who are on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus existed as God before coming into this world. He was in the beginning with God and was God, John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. As God, he had all the powers and privileges of deity at his disposal. Yet he willingly gave up the position and privileges of deity to become man and to live among us, so that he might offer salvation to all. As a submissive man, he was obedient, even to the degree of death on a humiliating cross for us. This is the attitude that we are to possess as God's children. But how do we do that? You do it by killing selfishness. If Christ had been thinking of himself, he would have stayed in heaven. But he poured out himself by becoming human to the point that he forgot his own needs and wants in order to take care of ours. How many times have you heard about or have you seen someone who readily risked their own life to help someone else? This is the concept. Later in the same chapter 2 of Philippians, Paul told of two men who were so unselfish that they risked being harmed for the sake of others. Paul spoke of sending Timothy, about whom he says in chapter 2 there, verse 20, 21. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who genuinely is being concerned for your welfare, 
for they all seek after their own interests, but not those of Christ Jesus. Then Paul told of Epaphrodites, a fellow minister who was from Philippi in verse 27 to 30. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly in order that when you have received him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Therefore receive him in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. If we are to develop this self-emptying mind, it must begin with getting rid of selfishness in our lives. In Philippians 2, look at verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Can you imagine... Christ ever saying, I'm just too tired to help you at this time, or I just don't feel real good right now. Could you come back later? Not from Jesus, as such statements demonstrate self-interest. I remember hearing the story of a woman who saw a car on top of her child, and she rushed to him, and literally due to her adrenaline, she picked up the side of the car to get the tire off him so that he could live. This is the kind of thing which happens when we take ourselves out of the picture. We cease asking what we can do, and we do the task needed. In the New Testament church, when we can take the focus off of ourselves, and we can stop asking, what will everyone think if I do that? Or what if they laugh at me when I make a mistake? If we just get rid of those thoughts, much more good would be done for others. Every Sunday, I will continue to butcher the English language by mispronouncing a word or two in the sermon because preaching the message poorly is more important than not preaching it at all. Too many classes go untaught. Too many prayers in the assembly go unheard. Too many opportunities to tell another about Jesus go unsaid because we center our thoughts on us rather than on others. The statement of the day in this twisted society is look out for number one. The meaning is clear. Take care of your own interest and needs first. But God pleads with us to reverse the order, to regard one another as more important than self. What a principle. Where do our interests life lie in the New Testament church? Most would say with those of our age group. When we are teens, it's on the youth program. When we are newlyweds, it's with the young married. When we have babies, it's on the nursery. When we have small offsprings, it's in classes for them and the children's Bible hour. And when we get much older, it's on the programs for the elderly adults. Now, all of this is natural, but if it goes too far as the focus is on self only, it becomes naturally wrong. Our self-emptying attitude or mind will focus on the needs of others instead of just our own. For example, if I cease caring about the nursery since I don't have small children, my focus has turned inward, and I am viewing the wrong things. The good work at North Warren should meet more than our own needs, but the needs and the longings of those who are around us 
who are lost and also who are hurting need to be helped. Paul says in Philippians 2, now verse 4, the very next verse, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Think of the difference it would make in the Lord's church everywhere if we really looked hard at the needs of those who were completely different from us. If we got out of our comfort zone, it is a fact of life that we tend to pull to people who share the same interest as we do. Folks who love sports tend to be drawn together. Those who have small children find more in common with each other and they enjoy talking to one another about junior. Grandparents are connected to other grandparents so they can converse about their grandchildren being the best in the world. People with personal problems in their family are apt to identify with others who are going to through similar troubles for a sympathetic ear. The challenge of the Lord is for us to pull out of our safety zone where we feel comfortable and to look through the eyes of others who may see things entirely different than we do and to feel with them. One of the most common statements made about Jesus was he had compassion on them, Matthew 9, verse 36. The meaning of this is that the Lord put himself in other people's place by looking through their eyes to where that individual was and what they were going through in life. If we would really take that mind, what a great thing it would be to live and be part of the New Testament church on a daily basis. Brethren would care so much for each other and the needs would all be met. Hearts would be touched. Love would always be present and people would not feel alone in a crowd of folks. In Acts chapter 2, look at verse 43 and 44. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. So we begin with self-emptying. Now let's go to our second self, which is self-control. King Solomon said by God's direction, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city, Proverbs 16, 32. Power and strength are things that we honor. The world enjoys going to a sporting event to see the strong and the mighty defeat those who are not so strong and clever. We tend to want to see action movies where some strong person is able to defeat a vast, large group of bad people going against all odds. But God says that the truly amazing thing is when a person has control over his own Spirit. It takes a better or stronger person to control their own spirit than it does to conquer a city or to be a mighty victor in battle. Later, Solomon writes in Proverbs 25, verse 28, like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. One of the greatest stories of the Old Testament along this line is that of Samson, a mighty judge over Israel. This extremely strong man was able to destroy any enemy he faced, but was never able to bring his own passions and desires under control. Because of his lack of self-control, he gave away the secret of his strength to a cunning woman and lost his life. 
how correct wise Solomon was. It does take more of a man to control his spirit than it does to conquer a city. Well, let's notice self-control and the spirit. Self-control isn't just something that we work ourselves up to. It is a gift from the Holy Spirit. When he is in control of our lives, as seen in Galatians 5, where Paul discussed the two ways of life. One can be controlled by the flesh and thus carry out the desires and the deeds of the flesh, or one can be led by the Holy Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit in their lives daily. One part of this fruit of the Holy Spirit's leadership and our walking in it is self-control. Now, does that mean that we have no power over self-control and that it is all a matter up to God's doing and none of our own? Certainly not. When Paul preached to a Roman governor by the name of Felix, the apostle reasoned with him about righteousness, judgment, and self-control, so much that Felix trembled at the thought, Acts chapter 24, verse 25. If Felix had not been responsible for his own lack of self-control, there would have been no need to be frightened or be concerned about his eternal fate, as he was evil, extravagant, and an extortionist. That's in verse 26. Also, when Peter lists in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 5, 11, the character all Christians need to be supplying in their lives, one is self-control. To be without this quality is to be blind or short-sighted. It is to put oneself in danger of falling away from God. But the individual Christian has the ability to grow or increase in self-control all the time if he chooses. If one yields the control of their life over to the Holy Spirit and allows the Holy Spirit to lead them walking in the Spirit's path, he will develop self-control along with the other elements of the fruit of the Spirit. It's true that a more high-strung person has the greater of a temper and the more difficult for them to develop such a spirit as self-control. But anyone can be self-controlled if he allows the Holy Spirit to guide him through the teachings of the New Testament. And if he does constantly by adding more self-control as the fruit of the Spirit in his life. It's also a noteworthy to note the root word from which the word self-control is translated is the word strength. There is nothing about this command which indicates it is easy. It takes effort. It requires a tremendous amount of strength to build self-control. Perhaps the greatest demonstration of exactly how much effort is involved in gaining self-control comes from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 25. And anyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Few things are more rigorous than the training that an athlete goes through to compete in some sport. A boxer to do well must train for an endless amount of time to get the body in shape for that grueling match to come. These illustrations describe what it is like. Gaining self-control is a strong indication of the effort required. 
the fact that self-control is listed in Titus chapter 1, verse 8 as a quality necessary to be a shepherd of the New Testament church demonstrates the maturity needed for self-control and the lack of maturity or spiritual strength disqualifies. Now, what are some of the areas in which we need self-control? What are some test cases to know if I have what I am supposed to have? One area would be to bridle the tongue. From the book of James, we find in chapter 1, verse 26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Chapter 3, verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole body as well. Still chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. For every species of beast and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. The tongue must be controlled. It is never so tame that one can relax and allow it to go unchecked. Now some of the matters of concern with the tongue are gossip, slander, lying, flattery, and profanity. And it should always be remembered that Jesus said, Every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account of it in the day of judgment. Matthew 12, verse 36. Now, most of the time, people do not intend to misuse the tongue. We plan to be truthful and honest. But we get caught up in adding something to the story or making it sound just a little more exciting than it really was. Even in gossip, most of the time it is not intended to be malicious. It's just conversation. But all too often, what starts out as innocent turns into untruthful words which injure someone else deeply. If every time we began to say something about someone else, if we would stop and ask, if this were reversed, and I was the one being mentioned, is this something I would want said? That one consideration would surely stop many ugly, unkind words from ever being spoken. Another thing that we need to control is our thoughts. What we think about regularly will determine what we are. Thought affects action. No one is more spiritual than they are in their thoughts. While it may not be possibly to keep every evil thought out of our minds, we can focus the mind on the wholesome and the good to the degree that much of the evil is crowded out. Paul writes in Philippians 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence... And if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. If we could not control our thoughts, God would not have told us to do so. Someone has said, impure and evil thoughts are like a bird flying over our heads. You cannot always keep one from landing on you, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. Finally, we need desperately to control our anger. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Ephesians 4, verse 26. There are good reasons on occasion to be angry, as Jesus was when the Jews had turned the house of God into a den of thieves, John chapter 2, 16. And we, too, must be careful to be angry, but only over the right things. Too often, anger is selfish in nature, and it takes control of our minds. Anger is never an excuse to do the wrong things. Angry or not, we are to do right. Now, it's not always easy to find a place to rest on contentment. It stands somewhere between covetousness and self 
satisfaction. We do not ever want to think that we have arrived and are so satisfied with ourselves that we can stop trying to improve in self-emptying and self-control. But we should learn to be content with the situation we are in and with the things that we possess. It is important for Christians to be confident that if we face God in judgment as we are right now, that we would go on to heaven forever. But it is equally important to examine ourselves and to see we need to grow. It is vital for us while still breathing to always continue to increase in Christian character. Now most of the teaching of the New Testament on contentment are closely tied to the need to avoid covetousness, self-emptying, and self-control removes covetousness, so one might be content. In Luke chapter 3, verse 14, soldiers who were probably Jewish troops of Herod were poorly paid, but they often found it convenient to extort money by intimidation they had come to John the Baptist, wanting to know what they should do to be acceptable to God. And this is what John says. Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Now, remember, this was John who had absolutely nothing of in way of material possessions when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 10, one realizes a difference between avoiding covetousness and pursuing contentment. This is what Paul wrote. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take nothing out of it either. And if we have food and covering with these, we should be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and have peace. One must make a choice between living by covetousness and living by contentment. The two cannot dwell in the same heart as they are warring against each other. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 and 6, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? Well, why is the love of money, the longing for riches, the lack of contentment with wages such a bad thing for Christians? Because it puts the focus for a child of God on things and on self instead of on God and his will. We cannot serve God and money, Matthew 6, verse 24. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be as well, Matthew 6, 21. Basic to the idea of contentment is our trusting faith that God will take care of us and our requirements. If we really seek him before everything else in the world, he will supply the needs of life. Matthew 6 verse 33. Contentment does not relate to our situation, but to our relationship with God. He is our helper. We do not need to be afraid of what man can do to us. God has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Sufficiency, being complete or to be found full, 
is in God. Colossians 2, verse 10. Now, in our scripture reading this morning, when Paul wrote Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 to 13, he gave one of the greatest statements on the theme of contentment. In the process, he also revealed the things which stand in the way of one's being content. We have to remember that Paul at the time was in a prison in Rome. The Philippians church loved him dearly and desiring to take care of his needs, they sent him a gift to help. The apostle to the Gentiles expressed thanks for the gift. He said in verse 14 that what they had done well was that they shared with him in his affliction. This congregation had been faithful in sending him help all along the way according to verse 15 and 16. This gift that they sent was abundant and amply supplied his needs, verse 18. And he promised them that God would bless them for their gift in verse 19. Now, it is very important for Paul to get through to them as well as to us his appreciation for their gift without leaving the impression that he would not have been happy, fulfilled, or content without the gift. The gift would do both him and them good because the blessings that they would receive from God. The difficulty in learning such contentment is indicated by Paul's emphasis on this being something that he learned, and then he says in verse 13, I can do all things through him, which is Christ, who strengthens me. Contentment is not the beginning course in the Christian living. It is a graduate study. Other things stand in the way of our learning the lesson in Philippians chapter 4. It requires learning to rejoice about the right things. That's verse 4. It is necessary to build a forbearing or gentle spirit, knowing that the Lord is near. That's verse 5. We must learn to handle worries by prayer instead of fretting, verse 6. We need to come to peace, which comes only through God and never from our achievements, that's verse 7. And it is necessary for us to set the mind on the right things as mentioned in verse 8. It should stand out from this that contentment is not only hindered by covetousness, but by worrying over anything that causes our thinking to set, us, set itself on us and on what we can do rather than on God that we serve and his unlimited power in our lives. Contentment does not magically come to us at water baptism with the forgiveness of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is something that we learn as growing Christians. The indication is that Paul hadn't always been content. He had learned such an attitude by living for God. Well, how do we learn the same lessons? Paul learned these lessons in disappointments, hurts, rejections, mistreatments, and thorns of this life. Contentment is never learned from an easy chair. It demands going through some difficult things. It requires facing times when we have no control and hurts that are beyond our fixing. Contentment is not self-taught. Paul learned it, but by the power that he learned it came from Christ who gave him the strength. If we're thinking that we can read the latest best-selling book, Help, or take some secular human course on contentment, and then walk away with a degree on the subject, we are heading in the wrong direction. Lean on the Lord. 
Learn to trust God. Focus on the unseen rather than the seen. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 to 18. It is not the size of the affliction which counts, but the view we take towards handling it. Contentment is at the heart of God. When we get closer to his heart, we get closer to contentment as well. However, it all begins by getting one's life in order, in harmony with God's will. Become a Christian and then continue to grow as a child of God. Then contentment can be yours as you walk daily through life, securely, hand in hand with Jesus. You begin that by becoming a Christian, as I just said, through belief, repentance, and water immersion for the forgiveness of your sins, and then remain faithful on the death. If you need to respond to his invitation, come right now as together we stand and as we sing.